Let's continue pressing forward in Solutions to Physics GRE GR0877. Here we go with number 71. Two non-relativistic electrons move in circles under the influence of a uniform magnetic field B as shown in the figure above. The ratio of R1 divided by R2 of the orbital radii is equal to one third. Which of the following is equal to the ratio of V1 divided by V2 of the speeds? So we're going to set this centripetal force equal to the magnetic force. And from that, we have mv squared over r equals qvb. Now, in this problem, it states that b, the magnetic field, is constant. And then the mass and charge of electrons, uh, they're all going to be the same. So we know that v divided by r equals qb divided by m. And it's going to be the same expression for v1 and r1 as is for v2 and r2 because q, b, and m are going to be the same in both. So therefore, we can set v1 over r1 equal to v2 over r2. And we know that R1 over R2 is equal to one third. So therefore, V1 over V2 also needs to equal one third. And that is answer B. 72, which of the following statements about bosons and or fermions is true? Well, bosons have symmetric wave functions and do not obey the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, fermions have anti-symmetric Wave, function, uh, wave functions and do obey the Pauli exclusion principle. So the only answer that gives us that in this selection is D. Number 73, the discovery of the J psi particle was especially significant because it provided evidence for which of the following. The J psi particle is a meson made up of a charm quark and an, and an anti-charm quark. Uh, this particle helped pave the way to new particle physics beyond the up down in strange quarks. Um, so it is answer D, charmed quarks. Number 74, the figure above shows an object that would place at a distance r to the left of a convex spherical mirror that has a radius of curvature r. Point C is the center of curvature of the mirror. The image formed by the mirror is at. So first thing to note is that the image on a convex mirror is always virtual, operate and reduced, i.e. smaller. And the thin lens in air for a uh, the thin lens in air equation for a convex lens is one over f equals one over u plus one over d, where f is the focal length, u is the distance from the lens to the image, and d is the distance from the object to the lens. So we also need to know that the focal length of convex mirrors equals the negative um, one half of the radius of curvature. So let's go ahead and um, figure out in this equation what we can plug in. So um, the distance from the object to the lens is r. And so we know d. And then we also know that the focal length is equal to the radius of curvature divided by 2. And we know that the radius of curvature is r. So let's go ahead and plug that in. Minus 2 over r equals 1 over u plus 1 over r. So minus 3 over r equals 1 over u, and u equals minus r over 3. The minus sign indicates that's to the right, i.e. it's virtual, virtual. And in this problem, it's a little unfortunate, but just a side note that the um, right is the negative x direction. And so that is answer E. Number 75, a uniform thin film of soapy water with index of refraction n equals 1.33 is viewed in air via reflected light. The film appears dark for long wavelengths and first appears bright for lambda equals 540 nanometers. What is the next shorter wavelength at which the film will appear bright on reflection? So our equation for the reflection max is going to be 2 nd cosine theta equals quantity m minus 1 half, that quantity times lambda, our wavelength. And here we have m equals 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. So for m equals 1, 2 nd cosine theta equals 1 half lambda. For m equals 2, 2 nd cosine theta equals quantity 2 minus 1 half, that quantity times lambda. And that equals 3 halves lambda. So we know each of these is 2 nd cosine theta. So we can set these two equal to each other because 2nd cosine theta equals 2nd cosine theta. So we have 1 half lambda equals 3 halves lambda. And we know what lambda 1 is. Lambda 1 was 540 nanometers. And so then with a little bit of algebra, we can see that uh, our second wavelength for which 
um, our next shorter wavelength at which it'll be bright is 180 nanometers, answer B. Okay, number 76, this is a tough one. A model of an optical fiber is shown in the figure above. The optical fiber has an index of refraction n and is surrounded by free space. What angles of incidence, theta, will result in the light staying in the optical fiber? Okay, so first we're going to apply Snell's law, and we know that n air times sine theta equals n opt, the optical fiber, uh, sine theta 2. So let's go ahead and draw. So this is going to be theta 2. And um, we're going to remember that n subscript air equals 1. Um, so for the critical angle, and that's um, the angle which you would need to stay within the fiber, um, the optical fiber. So our critical angle, our critical angle is 90 degrees, and so then also we can determine that right here, um, this right here would be because we have 90 degrees right here, this angle is going to be 90 degrees minus theta 2. And so we know for the critical angle for it to stay within the optical fiber, fiber, fiber n optical uh, times sine of 90 degrees minus theta 2, which we just drew right there, it must equal um, and subscript air times sine of 90 degrees. So we know that um, sine of 90 degrees equals 1. We know that n subscript air, the index of refraction of air equals 1. So n subscript op sine of 90 degrees minus theta 2 equals 1. Um, and we can convert sine of 90 degrees minus theta 2 to, from equal to cosine of theta 2. Um, just from our trigonometric identities right here. And so n opt cosine theta 2 equals 1 and cosine squared theta 2 equals 1 over our index of refraction of the optical fiber squared. And so then we're going to go back to some more trigonometric identities. Sine squared theta 2 plus cosine squared theta 2 equals 1. So we would know that sine squared of theta 2 equals 1 minus cosine squared of theta 2. So now we're going to go back to up here to our Snell's law. And so sine squared of theta equals the index of refraction of our optical fiber, that quantity squared, times 1 minus cosine squared theta 2. And we know that um, cosine squared of theta 2 equals 1 over uh, the index of refraction of the optical fiber squared. Theta equals uh, sine to the minus 1 times the square root of the index of refraction of the optical fiber squared minus 1. And so that is answer B because um, theta must be smaller than this because uh, larger theta would give larger theta 2 uh, and hence the light would partially transmit. Okay, I told you that was a, that was a doozy. Uh, number 77, a gas at temperature T is composed of molecules of mass M. Which of the following describes how the average time between intermolecular collisions varies with M? So we know that 1 half mv squared equals 3 halves kT. Uh, that's our kinetic energy and temperature relationship. So the velocity equals the square root of 3 kT divided by m. We also know that time equals our distance divided by our velocity. So the distance of the mean free path equals vt divided by the quantity pi r squared vt times n. Uh, and that equals 1 over pi r squared n, um, where n is the number of particles and r equals radius of collision area of two particles, so it'd be the diameter of basically one particle. Um, here's a very helpful depiction over here for more details for that. So our time between collisions is going to equal 1 divided by pi r squared n times the square root of 3 kT divided by m. And we got that from above right here. 
our distance divided by our velocity. And so the time between collisions therefore equals the square root of m divided by pi, the quantity pi r squared n times the square root of 3 kt. And so there it is right there. You can see that the time between collisions is proportional to the square root of m. So that is answer C. Number 78, a particle can occupy two possible states with energies E1 and E2 where E2 is greater than E1. A temperature T, the probability of finding the particle in state two is given by which of the following? So we're gonna use the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution given right here. And so in the numerator is going to be the um, state of interest, which is state two, so it's E2. Um, and so there you go, that's, that's gonna be our numerator. And then the sum, over the states of J in the denominator are the sum of states one and states two. In this problem, N is going to equal one, there's only one particle. And so Ni divided by N equals simply uh, the combination of these two over here. Okay, and so that would be answer B. Seventy-nine. Consider one mole of a real gas that obeys the van der Waals equation of state shown above. If the gas undergoes an isothermal expansion at temperature T O from volume V one to volume V two, which of the following is the work done by the gas? So isothermal expansion is constant temperature. So for an ideal gas, P pressure equals N R T divided by V, V being the volume, T being the temperature. So our work is going to equal N R T times the integral of dv over v, and that is going to equal nRT times the natural log of um, the final volume divided by the initial volume. But for the real gas above, given by up there, um, the, do some algebra on it, you can see that the pressure equals RT divided by the quantity V minus B, um, and that whole quantity minus A over the volume squared. And so then again, if we integrate it with our, with our work function, so work is simply going to equal RT times the integral of dV over V minus B. And again, that quantity minus A times the integral of dV over V squared. So that's that. And then up here is that. So work is going to equal um, RT land times the quantity V2 minus B divided by the quantity V1 minus B, and that whole quantity minus A times one over minus V2, that quantity minus one over minus V1. And so then if you simplify and do the algebra down here, that is going to answer, uh, equal answer D. Number 80. A one kilogram block attached to a spring vibrates with a frequency of one hertz on a frictionless horizontal table. Two springs identical to the original spring are attached in parallel to an eight kilogram block placed on the same table. Which of the following gives the frequency of vibration of the eight kilogram block? So our harmonic oscillator, uh, the frequency um, F1 is gonna equal one half pi times the square root of K over M and that equals one hertz as the problem indicates. Um, F2, is gonna equal one half pi times two times the spring constant um, divided by divided by eight m and that whole quantity square root. And so that comes from one kilogram to eight kilograms. So there's our eight m and one m and then um, we're gonna have two times the spring constant k because it's attached in parallel um, to two springs. So there's our k to our 2k for our, uh, for our second spring. So then f2 is simply gonna equal 1 half pi, that quantity times the square root of uh, one times the spring constant k divided by four m, and that equals 1 half pi times 1 half the square root of k divided by m, and that, as you notice, equals 1 half of f1 and so one half of F1 is simply one half a hertz. And that's answer C. Okay, we're getting close to the finish line. I'll see you in the, uh, the next set of videos.